Have you ever envied a baby? Have you ever envied a baby? Yeah? Okay, good. I'm glad someone has. Uh, let's, let's talk about why being a, a baby is great. Well, first of all, there's the sleep, right? Babies get to sleep like 20 hours a day. They get to sleep whenever they want, wherever they want. They get to sleep, and then when they've, we've had enough sleeping, they party. They'll party late into the night, early into the morning, wherever, whatever. They will do that. They decide to throw a party in a public place. Everyone just looks at you with the screaming baby and says, oh, they've got a newborn. And then you've got the whole eating issue. And they can eat to their heart's content, and if they gain weight, it's a good thing. <laughs> they don't have to go on any diets. There's no responsibility. Uh, there, nothing is a baby's fault. And that every, everybody loves you when you're a baby. It's, just, it's so cool uh, to see the, the smile that a baby, that an infant can bring to our face as we see the, the new life. Uh, um, I, I heard it said uh, just beautifully, if I can repeat it, that uh, every child born is God's promise uh, for the future. That God has a will and desire to carry on the human race. Uh, I have uh, definitely uh, been a little envious of, of Matthew in our house. Matthew is our three-month-old child. And uh, he gets to spend all this quality time with Camila. It's so wonderful. I get to spend all this quality time with my wife, getting pampered by her all day long. It's wonderful. <laughs> I've got to go to work and do all this stuff, and Matthew just gets to hang out with her all the time. One of the greatest things about baby life, though, is the pacifier. Is the pacifier. Now, if you've been a parent, you, you know the wonder and the magic of the pacifier because that baby could be screaming their head off and, and just all upset and all that, and then here comes the pacifier, and you give the baby the pacifier, and it sucks and chews and looks up at you, and everything's right with the world. Everything's at peace. One of the worst, one of the worst instances of being a parent is when you can't find the pacifier, <laughs> and so you're just tearing up every, we're having some of those, we've got pacifiers upstairs in our house and downstairs in our house, and, and sometimes we're, flirt, we're running up and down trying to find the pacifier, get Matthew to to settle and to calm. It doesn't matter. Maybe the, the, the baby's dirty, the baby's tired, the baby's hungry, whatever it is, the pacifier makes all things right. Uh, and in a year like, uh, in a year like this year, it would be great to have an adult pacifier. 2020 just is, it's just been, there's been so much stress that has been introduced this year. Uh, the divisiveness of the political elections and all that, and then uh, the whole pandemic has introduced all these concerns that we don't normally have to deal with. And in fact, the uh, American Psychological Association said that 62% si that, uh, of Americans are more stressed this year than they were last year. And, and so when you think about stress around the holidays, it's normally a considerable amount of stress as you're trying to buy gifts and all that and make ends meet. And, and so even now, there's more of a need for peace. Uh, it wouldn't be great to have automatic peace as we talk about peace this morning. If we're talking about it, we should define it. Here's a few definitions in the dictionary. First of all, just a mutual harmony between people groups, especially in personal relations. So when someone asks for world peace, they want all the wars to end, no more countries killing each other, and so a cessation of hostilities between people. Now, then you have the freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts and emotion, so kind of the personal peace. This is when you get away from the busyness of life and you settle, and you're able to just enjoy peace and quiet. And so this may be for those of us that might like to go out in the nature, watch the beach, or any of those things, just this, this quietness, this peace. Uh, um, as, as we move into more uh, biblically-centered definitions, one of which Ross mentioned this morning, uh, peace being a state of tranquility or wholeness, so it's more than simply a lack of noise. It's more than simply a lack of fighting between people, between nations. There's a state of, of, of tranquility, of wholeness. There's, there's no need to make a fuss because all is right within. And ultimately, there's two words in the Bible that are used for peace. One is shalom. The other is irene. Or irene. Sometimes I mix the, the Greek pronunciations. But the idea here is that it's love and loyalty with God and one another. That our, 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 the love that we have with God is so sufficient for us that we're at peace. The love 
uh, flows out from us to others, and there's just ultimate peace between ourselves and with God. One of, but th- these are kind of academic definitions, and we all agree that yeah, these are all good things, but one of the more telling things is to look at the antonyms of peace, to look at the antonyms of, of peace. And, and as I read through this list, it's a lengthy list, as I read through this, just think about, do, do, are these represented in the world today? And there's not a whole lot we can do about that, but are these represented in your world, in, in your life? Now listen, listen to these antonyms, opposite of peace. Consternation, desperation, discomfort, discomposure, dismay, distress, and disturbance. You have doubt, you have dread, edginess, and a fear and a foreboding of what the future holds or what even later on today might hold. You have people that are in jitters, they're jumpy, they're nervous. There's a strain on us, a soul strain. There's stress and suspense, there's tension, torment, upset, uncertainty, and unrest. Don't these words describe the culture that we live in? There's a real need for peace. And, and maybe, w- if we're not careful as, as Christians, uh, that peace that we have with the Lord and with one another will erode if we allow all this to, to impact us. And so we really want uh, today, especially for us to be reflective of ourselves. Our, our, which which de- is the definition of peace representative of our life, or is it, are it these words? How wonderful it would be to just let all of this go, let all of this go, and experience lasting peace. This is a big deal because not only, when we read that list of antonyms, the opposite of peace, we we all see that it's bad, but we know the effect that it has in our lives. You have the, uh, the sleeplessness, irritability, There's health issues of all kinds, heart issues, stroke, stress, relational breakdowns, poor performance at work and and, and family, and then there's a great amount of pain. And so uh, when you could take someone who is experiencing all of these difficulties and you you bring peace in, and you mark the Christian. And so thinking about, uh, and I always ask this question, but I'll ask it to you today as well. What difference will this sermon make in our lives? Why is this passage relevant to us today? Is it relevant to me today? What can we learn from Luke 2, verses 25 to 35? What could he pick up? And if we really study it carefully and learn from it, this could transform our lives, getting us back on track to where we need to be, giving us much-needed peace and relief from all the stress of life. And so we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35, as Josh has read. I'm going to give you a one-time exception this morning. This is a special sermon, okay? We're talking about peace. So if you nod off, you fall asleep, it's okay with me. You're just practicing what I'm preaching. (laughs) So by Luke the physician, he accompanied Paul around his missionary journeys. He had access to the apostles and to so many people And he was tasked by a man named Theophilus, which means lover of God, to write an orderly account. And so when we open up up the book of Luke, what we're doing is we're opening up uh, the record of of eyewitnesses to Jesus' life and ministry. It's wonderful. And so as we're reading in Luke 2, we're reading the account of eyewitnesses that were actually there. And so it could have been maybe maybe Mary was the one who recorded or or told the story of what's happening in Luke chapter 2. When we look at peace, first we look at a person. We look at a person. Beginning in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. And so we we learn a whole lot about the Simeon character in this one verse, in verse 25. So, So what do we learn? What can we learn about Simeon? Well, first, uh, his name is a derivative of Samuel, meaning God has heard. He has heard. And so Simeon was probably raised in a Jewish environment. He's a Jewish name, uh, probably a Hebrew, probably raised to be a, a devout Jew. He was righteous. It says that he was righteous. Um, that, w- that means that he was doing what was right in the eyes of God 
and everyone. And so if you looked at Simeon, every, we would all say, hey, there goes a good person. That, that person really has a good heart. He was doing what's right in the eyes of God and other people. Then we find, that we find this term devout. He was righteous and devout. And devout means that he was following the law to a T. He was very good at following the law. He did everything commanded by the law. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, let's think about it. Now, he was worshiping the Lord. He was worshiping the Lord. He was offering all the sacrifices that were required by the law. That's costly. And so every year he would come, he would bring the prescribed, the prescribed sacrifices. He would he'd be giving, offering those sacrifices. He'd be attending all the festivals in Jerusalem. He'd be assisting the poor. He did everything right in God's eyes. And so the law can be summarized, as Jesus did, by two commandments. Loving the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and loving your neighbors yourself. And so if we're going to look at Simeon, he's a person that would really epitomize those two commandments being followed. Loving the Lord, loving the neighbor. So today, he, he'd be someone who goes to church regularly. He knows the word. He's involved and engaged in small groups and, and loving his neighbor and, and helping and, and doing everything to, to, to help other people. Giving, serving, sharing, loving, worshiping, just a regular fixture around a church, wherever church that he might be at. Uh, he was devout. And then we see this thing that he was waiting. He was waiting. How many of you like to wait? No hands. I hate waiting. It's terrible. And especially in, in today in Western culture, we hate waiting. You know, if, if we pull up in the fast food line and we've got to wait more than 30 seconds for our meal, we get frustrated. Uh, this week, uh, my, some of my carnality was revealed because I've been really excited. Uh, I bought a, uh, a new a tablet an Amazon Fire tablet so I could do my studying a little easier with uh, all the commentaries and all that stuff. So I, I was hoping to have that tablet to study this sermon with, and it was supposed to come on Friday. And so when I got home on Friday, I was all excited. I was ready to get my tablet. This thing was going to make everything so much easier and wonderful and all this, and then there's no package. And then I checked my phone. Order delayed. May come in sometime next week, and oh, it's just so crestfallen. Maybe it's just me. But when you're waiting on things to happen, you're waiting on packages to arrive, you're waiting on good news, you're, you're waiting on all these things. Some of us are waiting on Christmas, excited about that. We're waiting, waiting, waiting. So much of life is waiting. And it's interesting that here Simeon was, he was considered godly because he was waiting. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. We're going to get to that in just a moment. And the Holy Spirit was on him. The Holy Spirit was upon him. It's really interesting when you look at Simeon, and he was one of the few people that are mentioned in Scripture where the Holy Spirit is on them, um, at least pre-Holy uh, Spirit days and, and pre-Jesus uh, resurrection Pentecost. And it's just interesting that the Holy Spirit enabled him to do these things, uh, to be righteous, to be devout, to be waiting. And so the Holy Spirit was empowering S Simeon. So what's Simeon doing? Well, let's look in verse 20, 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temporal courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the law, the custom of the law required. Again, so, so looking at Simeon and what he's doing, it's important for us to look at what defines Simeon's life. What defines Simeon's life? When you're talking about something that defines you as a person, we can get into really tricky territory, right? Because we don't like to be put into a box and this defines me. Well, we can do that with Simeon. I do not think he will object. What defined Simeon's life? Well, there's one thing here. First of all, uh, the Holy Spirit was on him. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's in verse 25. In verse 26, he was listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him and so he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's listening to the Holy Spirit, and then you have he was moved by the Spirit, so he was obedient to. So he's full of the Holy Spirit, he was listening to the Holy Spirit, and he was obedient to the Holy Spirit. Do we see a common theme here? When we think about Simeon, we should look at somebody who was controlled by the Holy Spirit. That defines all that he is, and that was all that's remembered about him. But Simeon is a person of peace. He's not the person of peace. 
The person of peace is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And you see him described throughout Scripture in wonderful ways. He's the comforter. The comforter. What a wonderful thing that we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. A comforter. As we go through difficulties and trials and disappointments and all that we go through, that we can have the comforter giving us peace. He's a counselor giving us discernment and wisdom in life and help for what we're to do, guidance. And he's also, one of my favorites is when he's called the down payment, that we know that Jesus will return. We know that we'll be called to be in heaven because we have had a down payment, a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is in us. It's proof that one day we will see Jesus face to face. And looking at the symbol, the symbol of the Holy Spirit is the dove, right? A lot of this comes from when uh, we have the baptism of Jesus. And remember what the, the Holy Spirit descends as a dove upon Jesus. And so this picture of a, of, of a heavenly, of a, of a white, of a pure creature, a symbol of a dove, a symbol of, and the dove also, if you, if you show it to anyone today, a dove would be considered a symbol of peace, right? And so he, our Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is the person of peace. He's a comforter, counselor, and down payment. He's amazing. And to be a person of peace, we need to learn from Simeon and be controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the most important takeaway today, is that if we want to have a peaceful life, if we want to be peace to characterize who we are, we must be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Peace is not something you just try really hard to get. It doesn't work too well because we just get angry, because things, aren't, things are not on our terms. We hear that, that Simeon is waiting for the consolation of Israel. Simeon's waiting for the consolation of Israel. So what, what, does, what does that mean? Why did Israel need consolation? Think about all the things that Israel had, had gone through, Israel in the first century. First of all, they're under Roman occupation. This means that they were defeated by the Romans, and that they were subject to the Roman Empire, and that really the, the success or failure of that area depended upon how much they were able to contribute to the Roman kingdom. It was not about them, their freedom, their autonomy, any of that. And just to take a step further, right before they were uh, con- conquered by the Romans, they were conquered by the Greeks, they were conquered by the Assyrians, they were conquered by the Babylonians, conquered by the Persians. Everyone was conquering Israel. And so they were tired and weary of being a conquered people. But not only were they conquered by, by the foreign nations, you also had uh, Herod. Herod was extremely brutal. The local governor, who was supposed to be their Jewish representation, he was extremely brutal. You know, I think here is a man who, when, when heard that there might be competition, he was willing to, to go out and kill every male child under the age of two in Bethlehem. He was absolutely, completely wicked, and brutal. He also killed many people in his family, anyone that would be perceived as a threat to his power. Uh, He's someone that was terrorizing the Jews. He was wicked, terrible man, and that the Jews were, Israel and the Jews were suffering under his governorship. Completely self-absorbed as a politician. He's remembered for building great buildings and being very brutal. Those are two things that define Herod the Great. And then they're they're wondering, they're longing for the the long-awaited Messiah. They're wondering, where is the Christ, the one we've been waiting so long for? It's been 4,000 years since the first prophecy of Christ, found in Genesis 3.15, when God tells, he's talking to Eve and the serpent and Adam, and he says that there will come a seed. You're going to have a descendant who's going to crush Satan's head, and Satan's going to bruise his heel. And so 4,000 years in all of the Old Testament looking forward to the coming of Christ, looking forward to the the, the coming Messiah. And what have they seen so far? Nothing. Some prophets. There's a lot of false messiahs that were rising and and trying to start rebellions. But they were waiting for the Christ. Was God really going to come down in human form? Were they going to find spiritual freedom? And then not only that, but you have the legalism of the Pharisees. The legalism of the Pharisees. The Pharisees uh, were those elite religious Jews who thought that you could attain salvation by doing a bunch of good stuff. That's within your power to make things right with God. That if you go to church enough, if you give enough, if you have the right connections, you'll be considered good enough. But that's just exhausting. 
this idea that we work to appease God. We work for peace with God. And and you're always wondering, is it ever enough? Is it ever enough? This is the one truly distinguishing factor between Christianity and all other religions. Because every other religion is you get what you deserve. You've got to work your way to God. You've got to do all these different things, give all these things. And if you're good enough, you just might, at the end of life, you just might have done enough good to have impressed God. And the Pharisees were along that mindset in those days as well. And just looking at all of Israel, the suffering that they were going through, they needed consolation. They needed comforting. They needed peace. A quick aside, we do find uh, Mary and Joseph in the temple, and so it's probably good to, to see what they're doing there. And, and, and where does this fit in the Christmas narrative? Uh, well, this is 41 days after the birth of Jesus. Eight, so eight days after birth, there's circumcision, and then 31 days after that, there's the mother goes into uh, the temple uh, in the outer courts uh, for purification. And so they're, they're there, they're purifying Mary. Here's an interesting thought. Uh, the firstborn of every family was redeemed at the temple because instead of, t- instead of God taking the firstborn, which was his right, uh, then the, the whole system of the Levites and the priests was, was created. And so it's interesting that, that Jesus was, get this, Jesus was redeemed from ministry work in the temple. I just thought that was really interesting. But they were following the law. They were doing all that was required. And so, and so here, uh, Jesus was redeemed. The, uh, the sacrifice of birds was offered, which would, would have been that of a poor family. And so turtle doves or pigeons would have been offered. A more wealthy family, if you were a family with means, you would have, you would have offered uh, rams. And then that would have been used to feed the Levites. So think back to the consolation of Israel and where we are in, the, in this temple scene. Israel was in need of consolation. In what ways does your soul need consolation today? You, you stop about it just for a moment. Would you say that your life characterizes peace? Peace, is, peace characterizes your life? When people look at you, would you say there's a person of peace? It could be kind of it can be kind of convicting if we stop and really think about, are we peaceful? Or are we more irritable? Are we angry? Do things throw us off? Where, where, are, we, where are we turning to for, for comfort, for consolation? In what ways does your soul need consolation today? And then what are the sources of your consternation? What are the sources? What's throwing you off? What's, what's getting under your skin and really causing you disquiet? Peace is a fragile thing. And there's some of us that we can sit here honestly this morning and say, hey, you know what? I'm a very peaceful person. Peace characterizes my life. That's wonderful. Uh, and so this, is, this sermon and this message would be one of reinforcement to you to keep doing what you're doing. But the reality of life is that it's so easy to lose our focus. It's so easy for us to lose our peace. You know, it's interesting. Again, it can be so easy for us to, to be thrown off, whether it be the crazy driver or the package that's delayed or the, the, the relative or the boss or whatever it may be, it's so easy for us to lose our focus and, and lose our peace. It's not to be that way. In this age, it's just, I, I, see, I see Christians that I know are good Christians, but they are completely off the rocker when it comes to politics. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. Salvation comes to the Lord. And, and if, we put our, if we put our hope for peace in our nation, politics, we're just telling the world that we're just like everybody else, looking to the government to save us. Now, it's important. It's important. You know, vote and all those things, we've already talked about that. But it's disheartening to see how Christians can be so tied up in knots over our governors. And especially when you look at Israel, and you look, and they're ruled by the Caesars. Um, but Jesus had peace, and all the apostles, and all that they went through, Let's not, let's not allow politics, pandemics, any of those things. Let's not let this rob us of our peace. Like Simeon, we must allow the Holy Spirit to bear fruit in our lives. We trust in Jesus to receive his spirit. We listen to every word that he says and obey him without exception. That is true peace. It's peace with God. It's a stable peace. We have the person of peace, but we also have the promise of peace. Peace is a promise. 
And Simeon, when he saw Jesus, he took that 40-day-old baby in his arms, that precious infant, and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So what was Simeon waiting for? He was waiting. He's probably old. He's waiting all his life. Was he waiting for a baby? Probably not. I think when when the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would see his salvation before he died, he probably wasn't thinking, okay, you know what? A little bitty baby, a helpless baby is going to be my salvation. Probably wasn't really thinking that. In the form of a helpless babe. Was he waiting for just a simple promise of fulfillment? Not just any promise of fulfillment. This was the promise, the best promise the world has ever known. Salvation for all people. Salvation for all people. The Gentiles, the Jews, the whole world. Salvation for all mankind. But even more so than that, uh, he, he doesn't say you can simply dismiss your servant. I've seen the salvation for the whole world. Simeon personalizes it to see his salvation. See his salvation. Hope for the helpless, redemption for all mankind, the coming of the promised Savior to rescue us from our sin and brokenness. And the words that he uses now are, are really interesting. He's saying, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. He's saying, I can die now. That's so cool. He's like, my life's ambition is fulfilled because I'm holding this infant in my arms. Because I know that I've seen my salvation. What's, what's, uh, nothing else is known about Simeon other than this passage. than Just verses 25 to 35. That's it. That's all we have of him. And yet we, we need to know nothing else, nothing more. He was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit and he had a personal relationship with Jesus with his salvation. And in the end, that's all that anyone needs to know about us. That we are saved by Jesus. That we've received salvation in Jesus. That's the greatest epitaph for any tombstone. Known by the Lord, loved by the Lord, received salvation. A whole, having a wholeness of life and righteousness, eternal, eternal lasting peace with God. It's also interesting to note that when, when uh, Simeon uh, saw Jesus. He, he didn't say, look, a baby. But he, when he looked and he saw Jesus, he saw his salvation. What do you see when you see the nativity scenes? When you see the little baby in the manger, like the one back here? When you see that infant, do, do we think, oh, uh, children are wonderful, beautiful, whatever? Or do we see that in the, in the child Christ, that that was Jesus being sent as a baby to live a human life and to die on behalf, our behalf. So when you see those nativity scenes, that's salvation. That's God's love in a manger. And we look back to what, what Israel was waiting for. Israel was waiting for deliverance from Rome. They're they hoping that their the consolation of Israel was going to be deliverance from all these conquering countries. Uh, they, were, uh, they were waiting for a conquering hero. We see this uh, throughout the Gospels as the disciples continue to want Jesus to set up a, an earthly kingdom and to, to liberate Israel politically. We don't see those things. What Israel was truly waiting for was the promise that God gave to Abraham, that through Abraham, a descendant of Abraham, would be the light of all the world, bless the entire world, of every nation, every people. That Jesus would bring, that he's the light, it brings wisdom, clarity, hope, vision, and direction to the world. He's a spiritual light for all of us. And just think about how wonderful light is. We're just reminded every year about this time, right? At the end of October, when they take that hour of daylight from us, and it's five o'clock, and we all drive home in the darkness, and it's kind of frustrating because I can't go out and play in the backyard with my boys because it's all dark outside. 
And just when we have that light, it just, it, there's freedom and there's joy and there's safety, security in the light. And in the same way that, that physical light does all these things for us, the spiritual, Jesus is the spiritual light that gives us freedom. But even beyond uh, being a light to the world, Jesus is the, ex- the exhibition of God's glory. That Jesus is the crowning glory of God, the cl- crowning achievement of Israel was the birth of Jesus. And so uh, God's glory is God's character revealed, and, it, and here you have God's character revealed perfectly in his son and the son of, of God. And so all this was fulfilled through Jesus, the longing and the waiting expected hoping that the, the, that the Israel had and that Simeon was holding this baby in his arms he's holding the light of the world in his arms the fullness of the glory of God that hope revealed to us and so it's wonderful when we hear these Christmas songs and I, I just I love singing Christmas songs uh, Christmas hymns not the grandmother got run over by the rainbow but like the actual you know like uh, whether it be uh Charles Wesley, whoever it is, talking about the great hope of the Lord. And it's, it's always fun about this time when you go to the theme parks. You maybe, uh, I love going to Busch Gardens or SeaWorld, and they're, they're playing all these Christmas hymns, and we're singing Silent Night, and we're praising Jesus while walking around. It's just so incredible. And as we're singing these songs, we're thinking about all the hopes of all mankind are fulfilled in Jesus. Come to rescue us. What are you longing for? What are you waiting for? We talked about what Israel is waiting for. What are you waiting for? If we're honest with ourselves. Now, some of us have great anticipation for Christmas. We cannot wait to open presents, to open gifts. Anyone ready for Christmas? Waiting for Christmas? Yes, yes, yes. It's great. Especially wonderful when you're a child and you're waiting and wondering what is underneath the tree. What's going on? And so a lot of us are waiting for Christmas. Excited about that. A lot of us, who's ready for 2021? Yeah, you guys ready? Come on, we should do better than that. Ready for that new year. We're out of 2020. All the, all the challenges you've experienced in this year will magically disappear on December 31st and that roll over the one digit on our calendar. Well, everything will be in the past. Is that how it works? 2020, in all, in all the history of the world, 2020 hasn't been so bad. The last pandemic that swept the world took the lives of 50 million people. That's the Spanish flu in 1918. And so all things considered, 2020 has it, well, it's been challenging. I mean, really? <laughs> it hasn't been that terrible. Um, it's brought challenges, and some of us personally, tragedies hit home. But the world's not at war. Nuclear, nuclear war is not hanging over our head. We don't have Holocaust happening. Waiting for 2021, it's good, but that's not where our hope is. Some of us are hoping for a better life. It feels like life can be just a series of if only. If, if only I was out of my parents' house. If only I was out from under their tyrannical rule in the house where I have to follow all the rules and I can go and I can go to college. Or I can go and I get my own job. I can work for myself. I can do all this stuff. I can, I can, and then after college, if only I was graduated and had that degree. And then if, if only I was at the better, if I only had a job that could pay the bills. And it's, if only I had a better job or a better job, more responsibility. Uh, and then, uh, if only I had saved more in retirement, <laughs> or if only the stock market was better, if only I had better health. Um, and it's it just like so many if onlys, and just so much, we, we pile up all this if onlys, and we're missing out on peace. That all we have is right here in front of us. All we need is right here in front of us. We have all we need. A convicting thought for me is, as I was preparing this message is, are we waiting for Jesus to return? Here we have Simeon who was waiting for the Messiah to come. But I don't, I don't, know, if it's, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's probably bad, worse than I, I make it out to be. But like, I, I almost don't want Jesus to return because I want to love my wife well. I want to love my children well. I want to disciple. and I want to, to do all these things. And, and it's kind of, you can look at that, that kind of mentality before you think I'm horrible, of, uh, of Paul saying to live as Christ, to die as gain. Like, I want to make the most of absolutely every minute here. But yet, at the same time, that's kind of a codependent uh, way of viewing life. All that needs to be known about me is that I receive Jesus and I peace through him. That's all that needs to happen. And all the dreams or hopes that I have are, are, are small things compared to that. 
And if we only really thought about how wonderful it's going to be when Jesus returns, think about that. We should be pining for the return of Christ. I, I, as, I was, as I was talking about uh, this to the, at the sermon last night, the service last night, I was telling them that we should all be rooting for me not to have this, give this sermon twice. And hopefully Jesus would have come last night and taken us all away. And that every day is a day that Jesus could return. And we're filled with that hope and that excitement that we'll be with him. And why is it that we so often are more excited about Christmas, another year, a new year, a better life than we are of Jesus' return? And that excitement about either Jesus returning or us being with him should drive everything that we do. And, and it's out of that anticipation, that excitement, that we live life. Peace isn't just a possibility. It's a promise. It's a promise that's made perfect through the propitiation of Jesus Christ. We claim this promise by trusting in his redeeming work, rescue, and return. And I had to use the term propitiation because it's a P, and I was working on those P's there in the sentence. But it's, it conveys a wonderful truth that Jesus paid the debt that we owe, that he gave his life for us, and we do not have to go through this idea of legalism, trying to earn God's approval or, or somehow make, make good all the wrongs we've ever done in life, that he died for us, that he made a way for us, he paved the way for us. And that's our promise, that's our hope, that's all that we need. And that he has redeemed us from sin and he's rescuing us, we're helpless by ourselves and he will return, that's a promise. And just as sure as the promise it is of his first coming, his promise of his, of his return is absolutely certain. Only the timing is uncertain, and only he knows. So if we ended here, we would all be happy, right? This is a great Christmas sermon, great Christmas service. We talked about Simeon, we talked about little infant babies, we talked about all the happy stuff. But is Simeon finished here? No, he is not. And so in studying this and, and truly understand this passage and understand what it means for us, we continue and we look at a price. Peace has a price. The child's father and, mo and mother marveled at what was said about him. So we have Joseph and Mary, they're sitting there and they're hearing all these praises sung about Jesus. And that, that was something that was, was kind of a theme at this point. Because you, you heard that from uh, from, the, uh, from the shepherds and from all that are around, the angels that were greeting, uh, Zechariah, Elizabeth, Joseph, and Mary. There's, all this has been positive and wonderful and glory in the highest, peace on earth. Isn't this wonderful? And Simeon praised God and he blessed them. He blessed Joseph and Mary. But then he turned specifically to Mary, specifically to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he says this, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts and hearts of, of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. That's not a passage you typically find on Christmas cards and yet it's extremely important for us to understand the price of peace. First of all, what did peace cost Jesus. It's an enormous price that he paid. Enormous price that he paid. And when you think about it, peace usually costs something. The peace that we have today in America, the cost was the, the lives of many brave American soldiers. And, and peace is, is, is hard fought. It's not to be taken for granted. Spiritual peace has even greater, greater cost. First of all, Jesus left the comforts of heaven. He left the comforts of heaven behind. And because we have such a difficult, since we have such a confined understanding of the world, such a small understanding of, of what it would be like to be in God's presence and to be worshiping him, it's so hard for us to understand what Jesus gave up just to leave his throne. Because here he is, he's being adored by angels, worshiped. He's in the presence of God. He's there's no sickness, there's none of that. He's just, he's, everything is wonderful. Everything is right in heaven. It's incredible. And yet he leaves his throne 
a place where he is worshipped and comes down to earth, this place of sin and brokenness and despair. And Jesus left that for us. It's so hard for us to, to fathom. And so, and, and just trying to pull an illustration to, to get our minds on what that'd be like, it'd be like on a cold night. Anyone here from the north? Like, real north? Nice. So, you know, up there, like, we got some Canadians here. You know, you guys know what cold is like. The coldest I've ever been is up in Kansas. And, oh, yeah, that, that's cold enough for me, anime. It's cold enough for me. <laughs> Uh, and, and so here, I, I remember walking around uh, on the campus in Kansas, and, and, and it was so cold, you know, down into single digits. That's, that's as cold as, as I can handle. There's some people who can, can handle colder. But down into single digits, and the wind is blowing hard. And, and you, you, got all your, all, you got all your coats, and, and you're completely wrapped up, but then you step outside, and after about 30 seconds of breathing, it's like icicles are forming down your throat, and your lungs hurt. And so, have you been there? And so, the analogy would be something kind of like this. Just to give us a, a slight physical idea of what it would be like to leave heaven. So, you're sitting, you're sitting at home with your friends gathered around in peace, and it's wonderful, and you're singing Christmas songs, whatever it may be, fire in the fireplace, you're warming your feet, you got your socks off, everything's wonderful, right? But then you, f- you thought, okay, well, I, I forgot, I, I, I had to buy that gift, I had that, to buy that gift for my aunt. I've got to go out there in the cold. And so you leave, you leave the comfort of the fire, the comfort of the, of the 70 degree house, and you step out into a blizzard. And the moment you step out, uh, you, you're afraid for your life because it's so cold and the pain is so enduring. And you've you got to love your aunt a whole lot to do that, right? And so that's the best illustration I could come up with. with. Maybe, maybe someone could do, can do better. Send me an email and I'll, I'll post it out if you want. But it's, uh, it's hard for us to imagine the comforts that Jesus sacrificed just to be here before we even get to the cross. This is the first mention in the gospel narratives of the suffering of Jesus. Saying he's going he's gonna to suffer opposition and re- rejection. So he left heaven, worshipped at the right hand of the Father, and he came down and was opposed and rejected by man, by the very ones that he came to save. You went out there, you, 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 you worked so hard to get this present for your aunt, and she threw it in the fire after you're done with it. She didn't care. Rejected. You can laugh about that here, but, but to think about Jesus, he shed his precious blood for us. And for us to say, no, nah, I don't need it. Not that concerned. Suffered opposition and rejection, men, but also persecution. Persecution. There are those that uh, opposed, obstructed him, but there are those that, that mocked, physically and verbally attacked him during his ministry. That came after him. Our response to Jesus says everything about us. And it's interesting, he's the light that come into, came into the world, a light that reveals life and who we are, what we're supposed to be, a, life, uh, that, a light that reveals a peace that's, that's available by, uh, by confessing our sin. But light also exposes darkness. Some people like light. Uh, some people hate it. And Jesus, Jesus, his presence separated. He caused the rising and falling of many in Israel. And it was so severe. Those that loved darkness persecuted him and ultimately it led to his crucifixion being betrayed and dying in the most painful way possible and think about this who was present at Jesus' crucifixion who was there watching that spear go through his side and out comes the the blood and water a sword did pierce Mary's soul that's the price of peace. Jesus, precious blood being spilled on our behalf, paying the debt that we owe but could never pay. And here Mary is watching as her child would die. What an amazing woman of faith. She was not the only one that had to pay the cost for peace. 
you look at the, the followers of Jesus, the, specifically the apostles and disciples of Jesus in the first century, and they gave up the comforts of their lives. They gave up their jobs. They left and dropped their nets to follow a homeless man around. They left the comforts of life. They left the certainties of life to follow Jesus. Not only that, but then after Jesus died and rose again and they saw him, they left their nation to spread the, world throughout the, spread the word throughout the world. They also exp- were encountering much opposition and rejection, opposed by the ones that they're, they're trying so desperately to give the message to. Uh, it just, it's always shocking to me when I read over the, the missionary journeys of Paul and how that some of his fellow Jews were so angry at him that they followed him around from place to place, stirring up opposition and trying to get him killed. And once, in one case, in Lystra, almost succeeding in having him stoned to death. At least they thought that he was stoned to death. His apostles gave up everything for their faith, enduring much persecution. And 11 of the 12, tradition tells us, were killed because of their faith. Because of, not, not just because of their faith, but because they wanted to, to share their faith, evangelize and share the light of the world that we have. You know, when we hold God's word in our hands, we just must always remember that the precious blood, not only sacrificed by Jesus, but sacrificed by our forefathers by wonderful men and women of faith who've left a tremendous record for us to follow, a tremendous example for us to follow. So you think about all, the, all that, uh, that Jesus sacrificed and all the apostles, everything that they sacrificed, well, what is it going to cost you to experience true peace today? What's it going to cost you? It needs to be sacrificed. Nothing. Nothing. The price has been paid. That the offense of our lives that we bring before the Lord, the problems that we bring before the Lord, the fact that we're not perfect and yet He is. We don't have to pay. We don't have to pay that. It's been paid on our behalf. Jesus has paid the cost for us. The peace costs nothing, and yet the peace costs everything. When you look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, Paul is explaining to the Corinthians, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit and dwelling, that your, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit indwells you, is in you and you've received from God. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify and honor God with your bodies, your minds and your bodies. And so peace costs us nothing but it also costs us everything. It costs us our former purpose. We're to no longer live as the world lives. And this is not even a sacrifice. This is a wonderful thing. How many of us have been disappointed by our hopes and dreams? We, we've, we've put all our hopes on leaving our parents' roof. We've put all our hopes on that new job or that relationship or, or the, the, the children or whatever it is. We put, we, anything we put our hope into outside of Jesus, it's a disaster, it's a tragedy. Because all, we're all gonna die unless Jesus comes back for us. And so anything we put our hope in that is not Jesus is doomed for failure. And so it costs us our former purpose, our former way of life, and yet that's a good thing. It needs to be shed. But we might need to give up some creature comforts. If we prioritize our relationship with Jesus, how's that going to impact how we live? Are we going to follow the the footsteps of Simeon, who's righteous and devout, filled with the Holy Spirit? Are we going to be engaged in reading God's word? Are we going to be are we going to give to the church and the ministry of the church? Are we going to show up on Sunday mornings even when it's cold, a freezing cold 60 degree morning in Florida? Are we willing to step out of that frigid cold and come worship the Lord together as his people? Are we willing to give up some creature comforts? It's sure worth it. It's sure worth it. There's the great quote, I believe it's Jim Elliott, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. We're to give instead of, instead of gathering for ourselves. We're to prioritize the gospel instead of just simple self-indulgent behavior. And reminded in Matthew 6, uh, do not store up treasures uh, for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy and the thieves come and break in and steal. But store, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where that does not happen. Where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. We have this picture, and we, we should have a high view of heaven. We really should. 
Because when you read this verse, I want my treasure to be in heaven. I want my heart to be in heaven, not on trivial things that so quickly fade here on earth. It, and this is really comical when you, when you think back at how silly some of these things are. Like, you remember the, um, remember the famous uh, movie Wall Street? Gordon Gecko, this uh, up and climbing. And they, they did a remake, so, you know, those of us that are younger, maybe you can see that. But you have this picture of this, this man who's willing to do anything uh, to make money. And then you see, you know, the, all these lines, you probably have heard them. Uh, lines like, money never sleeps, and things like that. They came from this movie. And it's really funny because you see this picture of this really wealthy, super snappily, you know, snappily dressed guy who's walking around the world calling someone late in the night in the morning. And what is he holding in his hand? This gigantic brick phone. <laughs> it is so awesome. Because <laughs> in the 80s, he was one of the only that was wealthy enough to have a cell phone. <laughs> it's just like, and people are, 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 are just shedding all, this, all the tears and sweat and blood to try to get, to be so wealthy you could have a cell phone. <laughs> it's so, It's silly. You know, and we look back on our lives, and would you want to you be one of those people, like, oh, I, I invested so hard that I was able to have a car phone riding around with, or, uh, or all these other things. It's just silly. Uh, would we, would you, like Simeon, be content with life if all we accomplished was to simply know and be known by Jesus? To know the salvation of the person of Jesus. That's it. That's all that we need that brings true and lasting peace. Peace from the conflict of this world came at great cost, yet is available to us for free. We claim this peace through worship and trust in our Savior. It is not easy, but it sets us free. So just kind of circling back to the beginning of the sermon, what what difference does peace make in our lives? Just think about that. Don't you want to be a person of peace? Don't you want to be able to turn the news on and to, for that not to, to set your heart in a, in a tizzy, in a worry? You want to be the type of person that's a level and even keel and when you, when you experience bad news that we can exhibit trust in the Lord and, and have peace and stability? The type of person that does not carry stress around and dump it on other people? Because this is, it's so easy for us to be that kind of person where, where these things just throw us off. Could we be the type of people when, when you walk around, everyone that knows you, the neighbors say, you know, there's something different about that person. They're full of peace. They're content. They're really secure in their identity. What is their identity? I want to know more about them. Will this sermon, will this passage, will the story of Simeon make an imprint in our lives? Will it make a difference? We think about him, the way he was controlled by the Spirit, the way he listened to the Spirit, the way he obeyed the Spirit. Or will these things define us? Will these words define us? It's one or the other. We don't get both. Either it's peace or one of the antonyms. And if we put our hope in anything other than Jesus, we get this. And this is not what we want, not what any of us want. And so the challenge from this sermon, the challenge from this passage, that whatever the cost, pay the price for peace. The first thing is that we must trust Jesus for salvation. Must come to a point in time where, where we realize, we recognize that, that we can never do enough to impress God. That all of us have, have made bad mistakes, we've made bad decisions, and even one imperfection separates us from a perfect and holy God. We do not deserve to be with God. And so we must trust Jesus, that God loved us so much, he sent his son to die for us, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And when we do that, we receive the Holy Spirit, filling us with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, against which things there, there is no law. And so we are to trust Jesus, truly trust Jesus. And if we truly trust Jesus, which means we're not putting our hope in anything else. But we don't just stop there. We worship Jesus. This is the, the promise of peace the long-awaited Messiah that came to set his people free, that we can look back and worship him when we see that God sent his son, put him in a manger, that we see that nativity scene and we worship God. So great is God's love for us. We worship him. We adore him. We, we bow the knee. We're, we're subject to him. Uh, when uh, Simeon talks about, now that I've seen my Lord, uh, the word there is, is the same for despot, that, that he's complete 
controller and ruler. And so we're to worship Jesus, worship God as our authority, as our king, that we are not our own, we've been bought with a price. We're to worship Jesus. It's such a trivial, such a little thing for us just to simply appreciate and give thanks to God for the many things that he has done. And we're to follow Jesus as well, to obey, to respect the great cost that he paid for us on the cross. And so whatever the cost, pay the price for peace. And don't allow the chaos of, of 2020, the chaos of the Christmas season, the chaos of this world to unsettle us. And that Determine that we will trust, worship, and follow Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We cannot thank you enough. We praise you for you are good and holy. Right now you are surrounded by angels being worshipped day and night in perfection, in glory.